in society, but also the understanding of women's oppression. So it's critical in a modern day revolution, anywhere in the globe, to look at what is happening to women. But in the question that she asked, you know, is it because you think that Muslims can't make a revolution, Muslim women are in some way victims? Actually, because of Islamophobia in Britain, that is the dominant idea, isn't it? So it is also precisely because these were Muslim women and men making a revolution that I thought it was absolutely vital that it is pushing back Islamophobia to say, look, these women don't need to appear as bombers, invaders, bringing the enlightenment on a tomahawk missile to bring the liberation. They're making their own liberation. And I think, therefore, that alone, the role that women played in the Egyptian revolution, was something that actually defied the biggest, didn't it? Denied the reality of what they say about Arab women being passive, about women not being able to, to fight on their own behalf. And I think that's absolutely vital. And we wanted to, and we still do, want to absolutely celebrate that. And it isn't just an Egypt, is it? We're seeing it across the revolutions and revolts across the Middle East and North Africa, an incredible role of women. It's courageous, because what we're seeing is the regimes targeting women, aren't they, to try and break the unity of the women. That's how dangerous the ruling class think a unified revolution of women and men is, when they target women. That's why the regime in Egypt even was doing virginity tests on women that they captured during the revolution. This is why women are being threatened with and being raped in prisons, whether it's in Syria or Bahrain. That is why Saleh in Yemen said it's un-Islamic for women to demonstrate, only, of course, to provoke many more thousands of women to come out and demonstrate in the days that follow. But for the ruling class, they understand how dangerous it is, if you like, for women to be part of a revolutionary movement. And so therefore, for us, as revolutionaries, we must also learn that lesson about how vital it is for success that, uh, that women are part of it. And for me, I have to say, the whole events of Tahrir Square and the revolution, you know, they cannot help but be the most profoundly moving and inspiring moments of my whole political adult life, without question. But seeing the women, and I just picked out a scattering of photographs quickly of, of, of it, it's really incredible. And if you think of the society that they've come from, in terms of uh, many of these women would not have been out in the city centre late at night with strangers. They were sleeping the night along strangers. They were night after night after night they were facing police repression and all the rest of it. I think that sense of a revolution making something that seemed to be set in stone in terms of traditions and culture and expectations of women and men being thrown into the air. But a revolution is not an event. This is something that we've had a theme through our Marxism. A revolution is not one event, it's a process. And in Egypt, the process continues. So we've seen um, on International Women's Day, the thugs attacking women who were celebrating International Women's Day on Harrier Square. We heard of the American journalist who was uh, violently sexually assaulted um, in the days following as well. And, and I, I believe that not only, obviously, I don't believe that the world completely changes in 18 days, and what changed, but that sense of a process. A revolution is both a sharp break from the past. It wouldn't be a revolution if there wasn't a break. But it's also a process that's ongoing. But I also think that um, Mubarak, the remnants of his regime and his supporters, are specifically using their thugs to try to break the unity, to try to attack um, women who want to fight back. So this is not just that, oh my goodness, it's all gone backwards, but it's that sense of the regime trying to push it backwards and trying to use elements in society that would push it backwards. And I think the, the possibilities that have been opened by that revolution, not just in Egypt, but the possibilities that opened around the region and around the globe are absolutely uh, profound. Because the other thing is, <coughs> revolutions don't go through stages. Oh, this is the stage where we'll do this, and then maybe we'll come to women's liberation down the road, or we'll come to you know, uh, sex, religious sectarianism down the road. That sense of the struggle throwing up those debates in the immediacy was absolutely there. And I think any revolution you look at, this happens. Even any great struggles you, you uh, look at, that happens. Whether it's a mass strike, even the, the minor strike in Britain of 1845 threw into the mix of the air. The role of women became vital. And this was a strike that involved only men. <laughs> there wasn't any women minors. But actually, great social upheavals throw the question of women's role into, into, into the mix and, and challenge old roles. And I think that for many years, 
the Russian Revolution in 1917 has been our touchstone, hasn't it? We now have something more recent to talk about. But in Russia, we've, we've talked a lot um, over the years about the role of women, about what the Bolsheviks did, about the sense of importance for women. And I think it's important to look at that because I think, you know, in many ways, you're looking at a society um, that, uh, for the Bolsheviks, that you, you have a society where women were brutally oppressed, where many peasants and millions lived in virtually feudal conditions. And yet, you had a revolution that, um, without a big women's liberation movement or anything of the likes of which we might have seen in the 1960s or anything, you know, had a sense that actually fighting for women's rights was absolutely central. And I think the, um, the whole thing also about uh, the struggle of the oppressed linked to the struggle of workers is actually it isn't necessarily always the big, strong battalions of the working class that open the struggles, open the era of struggles. It can sometimes come from the most oppressed, the lowest strata that are sometimes referred to, that sometimes rise up, pulling everybody else, shoving everything else up into the air. And in the case of Russia, it was women. And in fact, Bolsheviks said, no, no, don't go out in the international too, too soon, we're smashed, it's not, we're not ready for it. But they took no notice, and you know, well, the rest is history, isn't it? Um, the, um, they, they went out. And the, uh, later, Leon Trotsky wrote of that first International Women's Day, they opened the February Revolution. He said, Women's Day passed successfully with enthusiasm and without victims, but what it concealed in itself, no one had guessed, even by nightfall. <laughs> And to me, that feels so much like how we probably felt about lots of these struggles. We didn't know where they were going. We didn't know. Who would have thought that Mohammed Bayezidi, in desperation, setting himself on fire in Tunisia, would lead to a series of events that we've seen? Nobody would have predicted this. But somebody who just felt desperate actually ended up being the trigger for these, these uh, revolutions. And I think, therefore, you can see that actually simple slogans of um, uh, that, that demands being made on a regime, actually they may seem simple, bread, peace and land, or in the case of Mubarak, lots of the women had go, in English often, but not all, you know, the go was the slogan, wasn't it, initially, just for Mubarak. They seem simple, but actually these are demands that cannot be met without a revolution. They're not going to be met within the confines of how society was currently organized. And I say that we couldn't know that this is going to happen because actually, if revolutionaries could decide what the trigger for these events would be, if we could say, well, this is going to be the trigger, we're going to do this and plan this, well, to be honest, we'd have done it a long time ago, wouldn't we? <laughs> we'd have decided it was 10 years ago, or we'd have decided it was 30. These things, the ingredients, if you like, that go together, the ruling class can no longer rule in the old way, the working class will no longer be put up with being ruled in the old way. These ingredients, if you like, have to then have a sharp point where something breaks out. It's a qualitative, a qualitative shift. But what we do is fight to shape every struggle on the basis that every potential struggle can be one that generalizes, that flows, that turns into something bigger to challenge. And this is where you know the whole role of socialists I think is so vital. You know, whether it's the, you know in Russia it was the Bolsheviks who actually after the revolution, even in the midst of imperialist invasions and crisis and poverty and the huge challenge of this enormous country, um, they set up a department especially to address the question of women. Zenitown. Fascinating to read about. There's brilliant books and accounts written by women who are involved. They sent people all around this vast country on anti-trains and on boats and ships with films and shows and, uh, and literacy teaching on blackboards. A whole sense of saying, actually, how can women be part of a revolution if they can't read, if they can't get out of their home to go to a meeting, to listen, to be a, you know, tremendously inspiring. <coughs> Um, accounts of how it, uh, how it was won. And I think this wasn't just a byproduct of something specific. This was something of generating what struggle, what revolution can do. And this is where we come to my point about why I think we have to be clear about why we think revolutions are the, the key, if you like, for our future, the key to go forward. Because you do often get a lot of discussion about women's liberation. Do we need many women's only organizations? Is this the only way to address it with many men in some way, all those seeds of sexism or whatever? And I think we have to keep coming back. And actually, I think it's easier now than it's ever had been, ever has been in my, uh, uh, since, since I've been a socialist, to say that actually the working class, collective organization, collective struggle, and ultimately revolutions are the way for us to win our liberation. And this may not seem that like we're sitting in Marxism today, perhaps after four days of, of, of discussion, five days of discussion, but actually this is something I think we have to fight for out in the working class for because in many ways to some people, 
say the working class, the organized collective strength of the working class is how we get women's liberation, people say, oh, they're putting on workers in the sun, they're backward, they're sexist, you know, are you saying that, oh, it's because workers are more progressive than anybody else? It's not about the consciousness that's currently within the working class that I think the working class is the key for us to win our liberation. It's actually because there is no other social force in society <laughs> in whose interest it is intrinsically to overcome the visions. Intrinsically, the whole the old trade union slogans, you know, united we stand, divided we fall, is that's a force when we go into struggle. We're forced to overcome divisions <coughs> of race, of gender, of sexuality, in order to find better. Even if our consciousness doesn't, even if you do read the sun, if you want to have a united strike, you're forced to unite with whoever's in your workplace. And so actually it doesn't have to wait. We don't have to wait to get a struggle and grip until we've convinced everybody to buy a socialist worker, convinced everybody that women's liberation is a good thing, convinced everybody to be an anti-racist. Because actually we'd be a long time coming if that's what we would have to do for the revolution. That sense that the, that the collective organization struggle workers forces them, forces them by um, sense of struggle. And actually we all know that struggle is an inevitable product of capitalism. The dynamic of a minority keeping down a majority. The struggle is inevitable. The ideas that flow from it, victory or defeat, are not inevitable. They are things that socialists shape. But actually this is something intrinsic within the working class. And how Marx put it in the Communist Manifesto, he said, the proletarian movement, the workers' movement, is a self-conscious, independent movement of the immense majority in the interest of the immense majority. They fight for the interests of all, even people who are not workers. That means the working class can fight, it's the tribune of the press, the idea that they can fight on behalf of pensioners, of students, of the unemployed, of people with disabilities who aren't working. This isn't just about liberating the working class, this is about it being the, the force that has the political and economic weight to break capitalism, to break the ruling class, behind which it can, um, it can bring behind it the, the oppressed and other sections of, of society. But you see, the other thing that, that people say holds us back, if we're saying, oh, but people are sexist, and people have got backward ideas, and the whole sense, and even you know, people say many women have backward ideas about themselves, and don't think they're capable of things, or think they have the confidence to do this, or can't speak, or can't lean, can't get organized. And I think one of the, the key things that the struggles in Egypt and across have shown, and, and historically, is that the struggle doesn't just, working class struggle and revolution don't just have the power to change society, to challenge the ruling classes, domination, but those very struggles change us, don't they? They change the ideas of our heads. Because where do the sexist ideas come from? Where do the ideas, the self-limiting ideas that some women have about themselves come from? They're not born with them. We don't have ideas when we pop out. You know, ideas come from the society in which we grow up and in which we're socialized. Um, Antonio uh, Labriola, an Italian Marxist, um, Put it, um, put it beautifully. He said, ideas do not fall from heaven and nothing comes to us in a dream. <coughs> ideas come from material circumstances. And we can see this in our lives. Can't we? we can see how, how we think about ourselves, how we think about the world, are things inevitable, will the poor always be with us, you know, why are certain areas of the world have famine? And this is not, not, you know, we're taught why this is, but as you become conscious, you learn about things, you actually challenge these things, they're not common sense. Now the thing is about women's oppression, it is the oldest and deepest oppression. It goes back to the very origins of class society, way older than capitalism. And therefore those ideas can see more common sense than many others, even racism or homophobia. And that is because it's the oldest. And therefore all the more need for the huge social upheavals in order to shift them. Trotsky again said it needs a heavy going ply to uproot the deepest clods of earth. Women's, in a cliche, women's oppression is not going to be got rid of by a one-day strike or a two-day strike. The social upheaval, the turning upside down of society that's needed to uproot this old oppression is really no less than revolutionary, um, no less than revolutionary change. So the struggle, the revolution, helps us create the conditions for a social society, helps us challenge the rule of the elite, helps us challenge the system, but it also makes us, us fit to create a socialist society. Because we have got, as Marx said, the muck of ages on our, even us as revolutionary socialists. You sign up to the SWP and become a socialist. You don't, you know, you're not suddenly in this great socialist bubble, aren't you, sadly. Um, but you know, there is, we do carry the weight, don't we, of our past with us. But the struggle challenges and makes, and that whole sense, if you like, of 
future generations after a social revolution who won't have any of that baggage, who will just be growing up in a situation with no competition, no racism, no discrimination, no oppression, no exploitation. They will have all new and different ideas about how to live and love and how to have relationships with each other, how to produce things, how to be creative, how to be artistic. All of these things will be generated by people with different ideas. But the struggle of revolution will be made by those of us who have come out of capitalism. And that is the beauty of the struggle. It changes us as well. And I suppose I just want to end on sort of we're on our last day in Marxism, and I think it's been an amazing event. I don't know about anybody else, but I think it's really been, you know, a very, very special Marxism. And it's special because of the real world. Not because we're in new buildings and it's lovely, and not because, you know, the weather's been good, but because it's infected with the struggle, isn't it? Infected with the possibility that actually, we're not just talking about Russia, we're not just talking about these other revolutions, we're seeing them happen. Now to me, that means that all of our ideas are vindicated. And not just vindicated over there, but also vindicated on the streets of Britain. <coughs> Small scale, different place in the process, but nevertheless, the same process of the pressure on us, forcing people to fight even if they don't want to. They don't think they're militant. They don't think they're really, you know, one of us. But actually, we do have to fight because they've really pushed us too far. That is where it all comes from. That's the moment when people make individual choices to jump in with the struggle, who feel that actually the stakes are high and they have a stake in it, a personal stake in it. Because the masses are not just some disembodied thing. The masses are a collective organization of individuals, but organized where they're not just a collection, but they're a collective in the workplace. And I think we're witnessing nothing less than world historic events. Nothing less than that is what we're witnessing today around, around the globe. And for me, as a socialist, who has always said there's no such thing as socialism without women's liberation, the role that women have played, continue to play, and the fear that the ruling class have about the role that women are playing proves to me that not only is that absolutely true, that there is no socialism without women's liberation, it means that women are vital to the struggle, and really, the next months and weeks we have to throw every bit of our energy and determination and courage and everything else into it. If we have one ounce of the courage of the women that you see pictured in these slides, well then, everything is possible.